Good evening. My name is Bob Knight, and it's my privilege and honor to be Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. And it certainly is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this special event, a talk by Bay Area artist Kathy Aoki, selected for a solo exhibition at the 2014 National Print Competition, followed by a reception at the Turner. In just a few minutes, I will turn over the microphone to Catherine Sullivan, but first of all, I would like to personally thank and acknowledge the crucial support the college receives from our many community partners. Most notably, the Turner has a stalwart board of directors led by President Ginny Crawford, who work to ensure the future success of the Turner and the arts in Chico. It's been uh, a real wonderful experience to get to know them over the past 18 months. In the fall of 2016, we will open the doors of our exciting new home in the Arts and Humanities Building. The amazing space and place will prominently feature the Turner. In order to make that new space all we wish it to be, I am happy to also recognize and thank our growing community of supporters contributing both time and money to the transition of the Turner Collection to its permanent home. Thank you for all of our museum members, donors, and supporters. The Turner is a singular Chico resource, and it is certainly invigorating for me to be in a community that so values the arts. Now, it is my privilege to introduce the curator of the Turner, Catherine Sullivan. Catherine has been curator of the collection since 1993, and is a dedicated and extremely knowledgeable champion of the Turner Collection. With a background in art, art history, and dance, Catherine is also the founder and current associate director of the Chico Community Ballet. She has been recognized with the Mayor's Award for Excellence in Dance and the Visual Arts, and we are very appreciative for all that she does to shepherd the legacy of Janet Turner at Chico State. Catherine Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I would like um, to welcome you to this evening's um, presentation by the Turner's visiting artist, Kathy Aoki, and I hope that um, you will uh, remain seated for the entire presentation. If you do have to leave early, please do that surreptitiously. Um, I would also like to thank the Turner Board. In 1995, um, they underwrote the my idea that we should have a national print competition with the funding that we can now do this biennial opportunity to survey the nation's printmakers as contemporary artists and um, that legacy continues and this evening's presentation is a result of that. Anne Collins Goodyear, who's the co-director <coughs> of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, was the juror for the 10th National Print Competition, Pushing Boundaries, Expanding Horizons, and she chose Kathy Aoki as an artist deserving a solo exhibition. For new work, new artists too, the artist has the opportunity to create a new body of work for a specific setting. With this open invitation to create, the artist has an unprecedented prospect of exploration, engagement, and conceptual expansion. Kathy is here to, this evening to share her unique vision as a print artist and how it is expressed in her work. And I'm here to give you a little bit of background on her life as an artist. Uh, she has a BA in French from UC Berkeley and an MFA in printmaking from Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri. And currently she's an associate professor of the visual arts at Santa Clara University in the Silicon Valley. Her work can be found in the permanent collections of SF MoMA, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, Harvard Art Museum, and the City of Seattle. And she has recently um, made the generous offer to have her work included in the Turner Print Collection, and we're very excited for that to happen. Uh, she has uh, been awarded numerous artist residencies, including the Headland Center of the Arts in Sausalito, the Kala Institute in Berkeley, the Jurassi in Woodside, a public art grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission, and the Women's Studio Workshop Art Book Project Grant. Um, exhibitions of her work have been seen in Ecuador, Japan, Minnesota, California, Washington State, and Nevada. And tomorrow, as if it's not enough that she's here tonight. Tomorrow she will be meeting with um, our art students in Ayers 
129 at 10 a.m. And she will be joined by two additional guest artists that we have with us this evening. John Grunewald, from, he has his own press, the John Grunewald Press in San Francisco. And Catherine Kane, who's currently teaching at UC Davis and is a master printer for Smith Anderson Editions Palo Alto. So you're welcome to drop by for that as well. And now I would like to present Kathy Aoki. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, how many people are here for extra credit? <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to be here, and it was really an honor to be selected for this opportunity. And I really actually grew a lot um, as an artist through this process. So I was working in a certain way, and then this surprise award came about, and there were some twists and turns along the way. So it was, it's quite satisfying to have that kind of chance to grow, you know, later in your career as an artist. And so I look forward to sharing the early work and then also what happened this time. Uh, so, which is here is one of the first prints I made, which is actually in graduate school, um, first relief prints. And so this piece is called Look Ma, I'm in Graduate School. <laughs> it's, a, a two, um, it's a linoleum cut that you carve away and then you print with red, and then I carved smart and printed with black. And it's embarrassingly not quite registered, but I wanted to show that as an introduction to my work, which is humorous. So if you find yourself kind of giggling or something, then I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> After graduate school, or actually in graduate school, my thesis was men's housekeeping as a theme. So I made large scale prints. This one's like two feet by three feet. I guess it's not that big, but um, this is a linoleum cut with watercolor. And I used role reversal as a way to poke fun at the fact that women are still expected to do all the housekeeping. So when you see a man in an apron, it's funny because it's still not normal. Uh, after that, and then I moved on to women with tools as a phallic metaphor. So this would be after graduate school. I had an artist residency at the Claw Printmaking Institute in Berkeley. And so um, this is a large dry point on Sintra. So that means I just scratched into a large board and I rubbed ink into it and I printed it. And then I printed some linoleum cut text on top. So um, a lot of pieces in this series have women looking tough, and I kind of use Rosie the Riveter, like Life Magazine Images, as a basis for that. And that's actually something that comes round into the work again for this show. So um, this piece here is, I think, about five feet tall. So after removing the tools, I moved on to um, women as superheroes based on their job skills. And so I have this is a lawyer here. This is a linoleum cut. And I made this piece when the Powerpuff Girls were a cartoon on TV. So I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They were like three like kind of big anime style eye girls that would run around and save the city of Townsville. And it sounded super great because they saved the city, but they lived with a professor that totally tucked them in at night, and they got their magic powers from a you know, chemical accident, so they didn't actually earn their powers at all. So I made a couple of pieces about women with uh, vocations that were just really good at their jobs, and that's what made them super. So this is Excavator Girl, and this is a linoleum cut, a relief print that I watercolored afterwards. But then I made this piece. So uh, we're about at 2001, and I made this piece, and I got confused about my own work, and uh, because it's really cute, like the piece looks really cute. I'm like, why did I make that? I don't, you know, I'm, I usually try to say something. I have these gender issues. I try to dress in my work, and so I had like a crisis, and um, I was in an artist residency. So that means the crisis happens really fast, like in two days. And you're done. And uh, so uh, what I figured out was I needed to create like an environment where why this person, this anime girl, is like driving this truck with all these hearts and flowers on it. And so I invented a story that um, is kind of a reaction to um, the demand for girls to be both cute and sexual at the same time, and then also not have any voice. So this is like an ad for these brass dolls, which are still popular now. And uh, the piece that I made after I started thinking about what's happening is this teddy bear piece. This piece is called Sex Slave Porn Star. <laughs> and so it's, a, it's like a three plate linoleum cut. Um, it's only like four inches by five inches. It's really small. And um, at the time, Porn Star was like a new brand of clothing, like a clothing brand. And I'm like, what's up with that? And then, um, so they're wearing these necklaces that say Sex Slave right on them. And so these, in my mind, are girls. And these girls also have no mouths. 
And then behind them is this like ambiguous heart shape that also kind of looks like breast or butt or something gross. So I kind of like that ambiguous part that was happening in this piece. And so I invented the story where these teddy bears are girls and they're in this environment where the media is forcing them into these different identities. So this is the next piece I made, which is called Teddy, excuse me, Teddy Harvest. And it's a linoleum cut, about 14 inches by 15 inches. And in it, these anime girls are the bad guys. And they're harvesting teddy bears, and then they're going to change them into little slave workers that have to build monuments to girlhood. So this is the first part of that story where these teddy bear girls are getting harvested. And then later, this is the, now they're enslaved, and so now they're wearing like these crop t-shirts. <laughs> and they have like little cherries and hearts and like Playboy bunnies and things on them. And they're forced to build this like, giant monument over here that's going to be this giant open toed sandal monument. So, um, so I, you know, I went on and on with this theme for quite some time. So it started like in 2001 where I made that purple dump truck piece. And then, like, I think this piece is about like, 2006 or 2007. Like, I was on, stuck in this theme for a long time and I really enjoyed it. This is a piece that shows why girls are supposed to like ponies, which is like, I don't know. And so I made up the, this vat so that when the bears get processed, part of the deal is they get dipped into this goo, and then from then on they like ponies. So, uh, so this piece is called the pony dip. So this is part of the bears processing as they get enslaved. And um, this is one of the last pieces I made in that series, which was called The Construction of Modern Girlhood. This is um, about, it was on a wall that was 25 feet wide, and so it's not prayer making, um, but I just got really jealous of all these artists that were making really slick paintings that looked like candy. And I'm like, I, I want to do that. So I made this piece, which is um, just cut shaped wood, which, I, by the way, if you went to that tech art talk tonight, how many people went to that? Some people came from that one. I use the computer all the time in my work, but then you just can't tell. So I would design these shapes on the computer and then um, print them out uh, and then you know trace them onto wood. And I would also use the computer to kind of rearrange like how this is going to be installed and that kind of thing. So this is a battle scene that um, the evil anime girls are in these big boats and they're invading bear country and the bears fight back with Q-tips with makeup or on them and that kind of thing. So it, it just got really involved and and that was the end of that theme. And I needed to do something new. So I had an, an artist residency, so I keep saying artist residency. An artist residency is when um, an artist goes someplace else that isn't their home. And they get to kind of step away from their usual life. And um, that might be stepping away from your family or your job or just moving to a different location and getting to kind of focus only on your work. And then usually there are other professionals there which are very inspiring, like people more advanced in your career or maybe whatever, or uh, you know, talking to writers. And so I find that for me, um, it's a way to have a change in my work, like kind of have something happen. So I went to um, Paris and while I was there, I went to this museum, which is um, the Musée des Arts et Métiers, which is kind of this um, scientific, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like arts and crafts, but it's really the scientific explanation of, you know, it of drawings and instruments and how engines work and architecture and things like that. It's just a wonderful museum. And it inspired me to think about illustrations, which you're probably very familiar with. They came from Diderot's Encyclopédie. So this is a, a multi-volume endeavor um, in which Diderot tried to explain everything. And in it, he would have these kind of illustrations that you see on the right. Oh, so they say like figure one and figure two. So you've probably seen this kind of drawing before. And so I thought, I, I will make some of those. And so this is one of the first ones I made. And this is a drawing um, just with ink and watercolor. And so finally, my French major served me well, <laughs> because I got to that point, it's like my French, um, you know, after an undergraduate degree in French, I didn't actually want to go on to graduate school and, and study that, and so basically French was just like for crossword puzzles at the time. And so here I finally got to use some French, so um, this is, um, uh, pour que les cils soient bouclés, which means so that the eyelashes may be curly, is like the name of this piece. So all these pieces have like, 
French titles that are also explained in English. But this is all just about eyelash beauty, and everything is fake, like I just like made up, fake instruments, but it looks very official because it's in a format that you recognize as being scientific or technical. Um, and I made more pieces um, from this Paris visit. I made this piece when I came back, and um, some of you may have seen this. So this is my second time with a solo exhibition at Chico State. So I was actually here in 2012, and I showed in the University Art Gallery when um, Jason Tannen was running um, the gallery over there. So it's really my pleasure to be back in Chico again tonight. I feel like it's another home away from home. Um, so some of you may have seen this is a, a, an intaglio piece that was on display, and it's called The Brazilian. And so this piece is based on uh, this Thomas Aiken's painting, which is very famous. It's from 1875, and it actually shows um, Dr. Gross, it's the, the Gross Clinic. Um, the, the name of the real painting is the Gross Clinic, and Dr. Gross is saving the leg of the male patients here. But in my piece, um, it's a Brazilian waxing scene, which is uh, a procedure where you remove hair from very delicate areas of the female body. There's, I also made a Brazilian piece, and I also made um, another one, which I'll show you in a moment. So when I made those two pieces, I'm like, what am I doing? And I thought, hey, I'm making fake museum work. And so that was the beginning of the series of the Museum of Historical Makeovers. And so the idea is that I'm making my own fake museum, it's taking place in the future, and so that way I can talk about stuff that's happening now, and really the authoritative, the authoritative language and the presentation would make it funny, like poke fun at this stuff. So by having such a serious presentation, I feel like some of the humor of the work is going to come out because it's just too ridiculous to see like a Brazilian waxing scene like in a frame with you know in brass black underneath. This one is the eel leeching lesson, which is based on um, a Rembrandt painting, the anatomy lesson. You can ask me about that later. <laughs> this is uh, another one of those fake French drawings, and this in this piece, a um, pretty pony is being turned into a handbag. <laughs> And then I made some work about Gwen Stefani. So I'm sure you didn't expect to hear about Gwen Stefani tonight, but I made a whole bunch of work about her um, because people asked me why, and it was just too easy. So Gwen Stefani is a pop singer, and she was in the band, no doubt. And she went on to have a solo career. And she, on her solo career, took on like these four Japanese dancers. One was Japanese-American, and was from Japan. And she wouldn't let them talk to like the cameras and stuff. They were like had to dress a certain way, and they were called Love Angel Music Baby. Like they had those names, and I'm not making this up. This is Gwen Stefani's like marketing campaign. And when interviewed, Gwen Stefani would pretend like they were figments of her imagination, and they had um, you know memorized stories of. They were supposed to say when people said, "Oh, how did you become Gwen's backup singer?" Then they had these like over the top ridiculous narratives they were supposed to say. So there was a lot of furrow material there. So um, this is what you see here is a still from an animation I made where I'm, in, I'm imagining the Museum of Historical Makeovers is going to show Gwen Stefani's mortuary temple artifacts. So um, here she is with her Harajuku girl dancers. This is right when she started that. And I can't actually tell you which one is love, angel, music, or baby. But their, their initials, L, A, M, Z, are also the same name is her designer brand. So she still designed shoes and handbags and stuff. So she built up this incredible empire. So I'm not, I'm just kind of in awe of Gwen Stefani. I actually don't own any Gwen Stefani records or anything, but I was like, wow, this is such an amazing media campaign. You know, I'm just gonna take that and just twist it a little bit. So here I have a timeline. And um, you can see here is um, you know, Elvis the King moving on to Glenn. Gwen Stefani was born in 1969. And then Elvis, you know, health fails, and then Cher starts her rule right here. So this is ruling the pop empire. Uh, Elvis dies, Cher's in charge, but then Michael Jackson moves into the scene in 1982. And you can see where No Doubt was founded, which was Gwen Stefani's uh, you know, first band. Well, maybe it's not uh, her most famous early band. 
And um, so this is an interesting gray period before when Stefani ruled, when um, Cher just didn't want to give up power, but really Michael Jackson was in charge. So it kind of has, casts a lot of you know mystery on Michael Jackson's death here, like you know, thinking about that relationship between Cher and Michael Jackson. And then starts the tragic kingdom period, which I invent as the time that when Stefani ruled. And I also and even envisioned her death in uh, 19, you know, 2061. Uh, and then the reigns go over to Lady Gaga, who will look exactly the same when she takes power. And uh, here's a picture of Gwen Stefani with her husband, Gavin Rossdale. And you can even see on her shirt how she's going to pass away. A fatal attraction to cuteness. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I need a bunch of artifacts. They live Egyptian. Um, and there's like maps of her burial site and the Heart of Jupiter Girls burial sites. It's like a watercolor painting. And then here's a burial coaster that we found, found in her temple. So I like, made a whole cartoon. Like this is her back-to-back -back double G symbol. And these four stitches represent her skills as a seamstress. And then this is a cistern, which is actually an Egyptian instrument. And then here's Gwen emanating sound. And then this is the, the symbol for sun, of which there are two. Now, I know Gwen Stefani has three sons right now. So one of them is going to be disowned, because I'm not remaking this piece. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the bottom is the Harajuku girls represented by these four marks. And then this phonetically spells like Gwen in hieroglyphics. So I, I, I made a lot of work like that. And um, then this, and this is one of the installation pieces called the Tomb Room, in which I had a people view you could look through at a closed exhibition room. So it appeared as a like a 18 by 50, like 30 foot exhibition room that was closed down because I say someone um, damaged Gwen's um, the vitrine, the glass casing that goes around her sarcophagus. So you can actually go into that room. So you can only look at it through this peephole. And so this is one of the things I actually presented at the University Art Gallery in 2012, it's, it's, and it's really just like really tiny. It's like a dollhouse. But then when you look through it, it, it seems like a big space. So it was a way for me to show Gwen Stefani's sarcophagus without actually having to make a ginormous sarcophagus. Like that was the whole point. How can I not have a giant fake sarcophagus in my life? And the answer was to make it like really small and then have this optical illusion. So here she is again, and she is a spokesperson for uh, L'Oreal in Paris. And so right here she's advertising mascara. So I'm not sure if you've had a chance to see my prints over in the gallery, but I have a lot of mascara pieces over there. And um, let me tell you about that. <laughs> so um, when I made these pieces, they're an extension of the, the Museum of Historical Makeovers, and I make these pieces um, channeling other artists. So in this case, I was envisioning an artist who was practicing in the 70s, and uh, early 80s, someone was really good at landscape and decided they, they wanted to make these. Um, so I have a whole story, fake story about this person named Stephanie Wimper. Wimper means eyelash in German. And, um, and she, in theory, used a uh, <laughs> she influenced this gentleman that she was working. So this is Bob Ross, a famous TV painter. And I'm sure you can see the visual relationship between his winter landscapes and, uh, let me go back here, and the ones I was creating. It's, it's, you, know, you can see the, uh, he was heavily influenced probably by Stephanie Wimper's work. And I also um, add to the narrative by saying that she painted with mascara liquid. And um, this is the ingredients for typical mascara. But unfortunately, when she tried to use mascara in her works on paper, the jojoba oil, which I circled here, caused clumping. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with what clumping is. But when you paint, then it makes these like kind of blobs of blackness happen in the work. And so she was so frustrated by using mascara as a medium and suffering from the clumping that she went back to watercolor. So I have. Um, Oh, yeah, those are the clumping examples. And so, uh, and so that's how this work came about. And now I've started to take a little bit more ownership about them. I'm, I'm ready to like drop the museum story here. So um, as I move forward with these pieces, they have um, these dark blobs in them. And uh, you're probably wondering, what is that? And so to me, those represent the dark side of beauty. So it looks like a snowy landscape, and I know oh, it's so happy. Oh, mascara, isn't that cute? But then I put these black oozes in there because you know, mascara, and this is another piece that's in the show, um, this is a never-ending landscape. So if you go to the show right afterwards, 
I have an interactive display of this piece where you can actually touch boards and move them around. Um, but there's a blob in one of the pieces here. And that's um, kind of like, to me, the evil side of the cost of beauty. And uh, it's not an accident. I have like a bunny in one of those pieces because bunnies like, had a lot of testing done to them in the past. And also there were like blindness and death caused by mascara. This is an early form of mascara by needling. At this point it was becoming much safer. And then when Helena Rubenstein also made mascara formos, it was a little bit safer, but like women like, went blind and died by using early forms of mascara. So that's where those black uh, oozy things come from. And then when I got, was awarded the show, I thought I need to make some prints. How am I gonna make these mascara pieces as prints, and then I, I was, um, I heard about from John Brunwald, the master printer, Vito Acconci's work. So this is a picture of his piece called Kiss Off, in which he, it was a performance print, and so he was at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in 1971, and he, um, Vito Acconci is a famous performance artist known for crazy, violent, or sexual kind of performance things that happen. Um, he, put applied lipstick to himself all over and then rolled around like applied himself to the lithostone. And the lithostone uh, will take that greasy area and then allow <coughs> ink to be applied to that area. So this is a print made from him like using lipstick as a medium. I thought, well maybe I could use mascara as a medium, but I don't know. I just like use regular to show here's like, you know, drawing on the stone. And then this is the kind of piece that came out of it. Um, so this is a new piece I made for the show and it has a lot of Japanese landscape feeling to it, and I have to say, as I move along, I, I kind of started to really enjoy it, making landscape pieces, even though it, it seems far away thematically from my work, I just try to keep figuring out, like, how can I just draw rocks and landscapes? <laughs> so um, this is a Master Forest piece. So, oh, we're back to Gwen. So she comes up again. And there's a theme in my current show that is um, about princesses. And here she is dressed up for Halloween, and this is maybe four or five years ago. And she's wearing this Cinderella costume. And uh, I'm totally sick of it. Like, you see this all the time. Like, everything is princess everything. It's like every, all girls have to like princesses and like pink and like fairy wings and all that stuff. So I, um, you know, here's the Bibbidi Bob Beauty Boutique at Disneyland where you can pay to have your girl look exactly the same as every other little girl and have the hair glittered and stuff like that. Um, so I envision that these girls that are inundated with all this princess stuff are going to grow up and, and dress as princesses as adults. So I made a series of work that's called the Princess Fashion Phenomenon, and so I just like have women like dressing up. You know, and we're not far away like right now to have women just wear princess outfits all the time. And you might say, well, how is that different from fashions in the past? Like here's some fashions from the 1600s and the 1700s. Those are like, pretty like princess-like, but. Um, even this one, notes on, uh, which is by um, Jan Franz van Duven from 1708, and that's Anna Marisa Luisa de Medici uh, in the painting. So she looks close to a princess, but she's missing a few modern things. Uh, her dress needs to be pink. <laughs> she needs this wand. This is actually, you know, a bridesmaid party type wand. It says bad girl on it. And then she also needs uh, this crown, and then if she just has these fairy wings, now she's looking a little bit more like what I think, you know, you know princess about, like, in just like 10 years or something. Um, so I made a few pieces about that, and this is a stone litho, um, and it's called uh, Au Courant. And um, the, the granddaughter is saying, Grandma, um, I want my fairy wings back for my tea party, and the grandmother's saying, oh, come on, can't I keep wearing them? Even I have, you know, I deserve to be au courant, which means, like, in style. So, um, so I made a bunch of pieces that show um, making fun of this, and then while I was making these pieces, I was trying to channel Honoré Daumier, who is um, a, a political cartoonist, satirist, who did a lot of lithos, uh, and in this case, he's making fun of the king. Um, and so I made a couple of pieces that kind of comment on these, uh, kind of make fun of them. So this is called Not Another Damn Parade, and it's an intaglio piece. Um, and so you can see here up close, like, the princess is totally, like, drinking a beer and smoking a cigarette. Like, she's totally jaded, like, with parades and princess stuff. So this is, you know, how we envision our future, thanks to Disney and Mattel. 
Uh, I also made some work that has a fake Disney castle in it. So this piece is called um, Glamour Palais, and it's, uh, you know, for adult women. So it's a weird sexualized makeup kind of image that I made, and I did this on a computer in Illustrator, and then I made a silk screen from it, which is covered with glitter in the exhibition. And then I made some more work, which is like fake documentation to prove that this castle exists. So I made this piece in the style of um, Hiroshige, like just like a Japanese um, like in, in a inside scene, and then see, like, see the castle's there. Right? And then even in this piece, which I totally <laughs> stole the castle, um, and this piece is called The Destruction of Glamour Palais. The, the oh, castle is in there. Here's the original Hokusai piece. Um, and in mine, the castle is being um, inundated with water from global warming as LA gets like totally covered over with water. So although it looks like those are personal artifacts, they're like a small purse full of stuff and a small shoe, those are actually giant sculptures that would be floating out of the kingdom, out of the Glamour Palais castle. Um, and now I have a, another thing. And so this is related to my really early work where I showed Rosie the Riveter. Um, I took that idea a little bit further. So I made some pieces that are like beauty duty posters. And the idea that started this was, what about these Rosie the Riveter women that were excelling at their jobs and getting satisfaction from it? The war is over and now they're just being told to go back to this or this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how are you going to convince those women to do that? And so I thought, well, maybe the government had some kind of propaganda campaign to make that happen. And then a little later, Barbie got on board too. So I made a few pieces that have to do with the requirement that you be beautiful and who would be telling you to do this. So by conflating patriotism with beauty, I feel like I can tap into something that a lot of people may understand. Um, so that's a new theme in my work that totally is a surprise from the show. And I think there's going to be more work in this direction without the trappings of the museum stuff. So I'm just going to like leave that alone and see if I can make some more direct work. Um, and then the last couple of pieces I'm going to tell you about have to do with gang style. And I'm sure you didn't expect to see this in the talk tonight either. But I made three pieces about dances and then I put them in these other contexts. So um, I do have a gangham style ditho here. It's totally based on this painting by Toulouse Lautrec. Um, and so here it is. <laughs> So, and I made mean, this a big stone with a leg, it's like two feet by three feet. And so it was just very satisfying to make work in the same way that Toulouse Lautrec made those big Moulin Rouge posters, which is drawing on a big stone and then inking it up. Um, and by taking, this piece was really just for fun. This next piece has more of a social commentary. And I was looking at these old dances to see if there's anything close to the kind of dances that are popular now. And the only thing I could come up with in this American dance guide was this dance called the Cushion Dance. I'm like, well, that sounds a little racy. But there's really nothing compared to twerking. So um, I wanted to make a piece about twerking. And these are the kinds of things I do. I research images on the internet, and I just print out like, a bunch of contact sheets as ideas. And you know, I look at a lot of dancing. So mostly these dances are the vignette or the gavotte or all these old tiny dances that are quite straight. And then I made this piece, <laughs> which is a twerking scene. And so this is a little piece that I can't afford. And um, if you see in the back here, <laughs> that's like totally based on my scene. And yeah, so if you've seen this video. Yeah, it, it doesn't animate tonight, but you're probably better off that first time working. Um, and then this is a, just a screenshot I took from an MTV video. And this is just stuff we see all the time in our culture, right? Like we're used to seeing this kind of image and we just don't really think about it. But if you take those same poses and then put them in this kind of dress, then you really see how sexualized the, the poses are. So um, I felt like, so I did a couple of twerking pieces. And um, this is how I made another one, which is I, I do a lot of work on the computer, as I mentioned. So one of the Intellio pieces looks like an old time etching, but I drew the whole thing on the computer in Photoshop to look like an etching. And so I take photos like this of um, myself and uh, various models, like um, 
John Greenwald was kind of the model for me here. And then I would look at drawing rooms from you know, Massachusetts in the 1800s. And then I made this piece, which is um, an eight by 10 inch. So this piece is called The Twerking Lesson. And so when you see this work in the gallery, it will have like, these textures of like aqua tin and such. And I do all the drawing on the computer. So I, I, I have this stylus set up so this thick and thin marks. And that's the kind of the, the etching line to it. And then I um, use Photoshop to create the aqua tint texture that results in something like this. So I, I kind of like the idea that it looks old, but it helps you to pay attention to like what's happening now because it's a, a different environment to see those things. And that's all I have for tonight. <laughs> <laughs>